Uh, we're going to continue with looking at the fall, but a little bit different perspective of the fall. We're actually going to, I want you to uh, look in Ruth chapter 4, and we're going to look at kind of the, kind of the Redeemer. Let me see. Go back. I'm going to go back and just kind of review a little bit about the fall here. So in the fall, we see several things that, that happen. There we go. This computer runs a little bit slower than what I thought it was going to be. Okay, so during the fall, y'all basically remember what happened during the fall. Somebody just kind of give me a rough uh, description of what we're talking they about. They ate the forbidden fruit. Right. What made it forbidden? God told him not. Yeah, God said, don't eat of the fruit of what? What, is, what, what fruit? What the kind of tree was that from? Good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and that she would, Eve was tempted by Satan. She ate the fruit she gave to Adam. And then all of a sudden, things went haywire in, in, uh, in the history of mankind. And it kind of plunged mankind into what what people call the fall the fall when adam and eve fell from the lofted estate um the dominion that god had given to them they uh they lost a lot of stuff um they lost you know we, we talked about sin right what happens every time sin is is a prevalent thing in, in, a, in a in a situation what happens Sin comes on the scene, what happens? Everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. What's the wage of sin? Death. Death. When, when sin comes on the scene, something's going to die. And uh, if you don't believe me, well, all you have to do is sin a little bit, and you will find out something will die. Um, so, we'll, uh, you just, you, I guess you, you can experience... Or you can just trust me on that and don't sin, which would help whatever it is that you're going to kill if you sin, <laughs> right? So uh, one of the things that died, that, sin, that Adam and Eve's sin did, is that it, they were no longer able to see God. They were unable to see that dimension where God is, um, the angelic beings that were around that could no longer see them. I mean... It, it, it's kind of interesting because we don't even understand, you know what, you know what we've lost. If you've never had it, you don't know what you've lost, right? You know, if you if you left the United States and you moved to the middle of Africa, you would feel like you've lost everything. You know, you've lost you've lost your internet, you've lost your TV, your bicycle won't even work good out there, right? You, you got you got flip flops made out of spare tires that you know that somebody somehow acquired from the Americas. So you, you're you know even even the nice clothes that you had, uh, you, yeah, the, you've lost everything. But those people, they've never had it to lose, so they don't know what the you know what life would be like. Like it would probably just dumbfound a lot of them if they if they just went to our grocery store and they walked down the, the aisles and saw all the food and then you know you you just put in your back you know your cart whatever it is that you wanted you know they're out there digging up roots in the middle of the desert just to have something to eat and drink right and you show up to the store and everything that you desire is there um, you don't even have to go kill the cow you just you just pull off the steaks from the or the or the beef from the sh from the, the refrigerator in the back and then you go up up to the front to the cashier and you know what do you what do you use to pay with a, a piece of plastic those people they don't experience that, that they've never seen that they don't know what they've lost that's the way we are the fall, in the fall, that we are like living in the middle of Africa. We lost so much. 
And it's really hard to wrap your mind around what it was that we actually lost. That's why the Apostle Paul would say that the, the things that you have to deal with in this world are not even to be compared to, uh, to the glory that we receive when we get to heaven, when we get all that back. Paul's like, it, you just do not understand what we're going to gain. And what are we going to gain? We're going to gain back everything that we lost. And it's, it's really difficult to explain. You know, John, he tries to explain some of the heavenly scenes in the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, he does the best that he can. And it's a mystery to us. And it looks wild and crazy. And to John, same thing. It looked wild and crazy. And he did the best that he could uh, to describe those things. We do not understand what we've lost. So to see, so what did sin do? Sin killed that. Sin killed that. Uh, to be able to communicate with other creations, with uh, you know, with with God's creations, Adam, he was able, he was able to like, I don't know if it was teleconnect, uh, what, what do they call that, uh, telepathy or whatever, to be able to communicate with other creations. Um, I don't, I don't think that's why when E, when the snake spoke to Eve, it did not startle her. It was not something that was odd or foreign to her. It was an everyday thing. She talked to animals. It just, you know, to for us, if you, I mean, if you went home and one of your animals started talking to you, that would concern you a little bit, right? That's not supposed to happen. That's, that's you, do you understand what was lost here? That those, those kind of things were, were lost. Um, the life of the body. You know, from the from the time that you're born, um, you begin to die. And uh, you know, if you if you have a long life, you know, you live to be like 90 years old, maybe 100. Uh, very few people make it past, uh, you know, past 100. Actually, very few people make it even to 100. So the life of the body is is lost. You know, we don't. I mean, I I don't understand what it would be like to live. Hundreds and hundreds of years, honestly, in this world, I don't care to know about that. But you know, they it, they begin to die. Now I, I get it, Adam and them, they lived almost a thousand years or so, which uh, which is just a drop in the bucket to eternity. But God created us to be to be uh, you know eternal. He created us as eternal beings. But the yeah, law. Uh, he he told ahead. Noah that man point in time was 120 years you know sort of like a dual prophecy because that was Noah's time he got he, but then at the same time people started aging basically to that point that's the they did point. they did yeah they sure did yeah that uh that that was that's what you know uh, uh and you know you brought up the dual prophecy thing a lot of times in most almost every prophecy is is got a kind of a dual complex complexity to it if that make if that makes sense um, kind of like uh, the coming of Elijah, right? Yeah, the second prophecy is usually bigger than the first one. Right. So it has it has some dual dual attributes to it. So anyway, the life of the body uh, begins, and uh, that's huge, right? To no longer be able to, you know, sus you know, for this body to sustain. I mean, that was lost. It, they, you know, it begins to age. It begins to get sick. Those sorts of things. And uh, being multi-dimensional, it's kind of like it's kind of like being able to see God's dimension a little bit, but to be able to see the things that are in the spirit world, um, I believe that Adam and Eve could actually see that. And and we talked about it last week. So if you want to know more about it, um, I gave some examples of those occurrences in uh, you know you know in you know you know in the scriptures. So there's just so there's several examples that you can scriptures that occasional okay occasionally now these things are still they're still there they're still um, um, available but you have to be something unique has to happen for you to be able to experience those in uh, the way that we are now and not everybody had those and not all the time does that make does that make sense like Moses got to see the back of God um, Elijah could see 
the angels over there, but you know, who of us are like Elijah, right? I mean, that that that's a, a, a standard bearer right there. And he prayed for his servant to be able to see the angels. So those two were able to see multi-dimensional at that time. Yeah, Jesus said, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So that's kind of a little bit. There you go. Yeah, there. Good verse. So pressing on here, um, and we talked about that relationship with God, that died. Um, you know, we experience that all the time, and I know I'm hitting this a little bit hard, you know, prior to, and I'm trying not to stay on it too long, but we experience that all the time. People do not know God. They do not have that relationship with Him, um, and it's, I mean, it's obvious. You know, they don't pray, they don't read their Bible, they, uh, you know, there's just no power in, in their life, they live. They live for sin rather than for salvation, and uh, so that's kind of the issue that that we see all the time. Um, and we talked about, um, and this is kind of where we ended, that uh, there that there was a, re a covering that was required when Adam and Eve sinned. All of a sudden, whatever was covering them was gone, and they saw themselves naked. With no covering. That's that's really what that means. That there's no covering. So there was something that was covering them. And I think I I think I gave you my theory of God's glory on them before. Did did I say that last week? I can't recall. Um. So I believe that God's because they were around Him all the time. Just like when Moses went up to see God, He was glowing. He had the covering of God on Him. Uh, I believe that Adam and Eve had that on their life. They saw God every single day. And then all of a sudden, when they sinned, it was gone. And they saw themselves naked. It concerned them. It concerned God, too. And he says, what you have done is not good enough. They had put together some, some big leaves. And God's like, no, we've got to fix those clothes. Those are definitely not good enough. Not, you know, so what does he do? He sacrifices some animals. And he introduces them to the sacrificial system. That without the sh And the reason that the sacrificial system exists, I think, is to remind us that when... That because of sin, it causes it causes something to die, and for the animals there, Adam and Eve really saw what their sin has done, because the things that they were talking to the day before had to give their their lives so that Adam and Eve could be covered. Now that I don't know about you, but that's I think that would you know that would probably mess with my mind just a little bit. What have I really done? I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've uh, experienced the death of, you know, a fluffy critter that you really cared about. Um, That's probably at, the first thing they saw in God. Like, uh, it was. Well, they did because they killed the animal for the covering. So, and, and, uh, and then the, the traumatic, the, the, the traumatic thing. You know, we're used to this because we're, we, we live in the realm of death. Death is a part of our lives. But to see God kill those animals and then cut off their skin. I can remember uh, one of the first deer that I, that I killed whenever uh, Joy and I were married. And, uh, and I skinned it out and, I, and it was hanging up for a little bit. And Joy came outside and she's like, that looks like a person hanging there. <laughs> you know, it looked weird. It looked off. You know, to see a non... You know the fur removed and just the muscle tissue left um can you imagine what that did to adam and eve you know like wow this is this is what we have done and it didn't end on that uh, moment this was a process that they had to continue on uh, and we see it reoccur with with um, abel and cain we see it reoccur with uh, with noah and abram all the way, all the way through the Old Testament, that this is something that is required, the sacrificial system. That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Something has to cover the sin. And that leads us into the fix that God has prepared. So when, uh, when you see this loss of dominion by Adam, um, that really means that there is a, a really significant need for a redeemer. Now, one of the themes that gets lost in the scripture is the is the law of the kinsman redeemer. Uh, 
How many of y'all have had teaching on the Kingsman Redeemer before? Several of you. Have you had? Did you? Did you? Have you had some? Before? Um, I know what the Kinsman Redeemer is, but I don't think I heard your lesson on it though. If you had a sermon on it. So well, we're gonna we're gonna kind of look at it because a lot of people they don't they may know a lot about the Kinsman Redeemer, but they don't understand its importance. It's a big player in the Scripture, to be honest. Um, and it starts, and it really starts in um, when Moses comes out of Egypt. They are given the kind of the law of, of the Redeemer, um, you know, and, and, and we see it really play out in the book of Ruth. So we're going to look at the book of Ruth. Look in chapter 4 of Ruth and verse 5. And, we're just, and we'll just read through, I think, 10. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, anybody like to take on those verses? Which chapter are we doing? Chapter four. I can take it. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> five through ten. Yeah, five through ten. Then said Boaz, that what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabite, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said. I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I marry mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in the former time of Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, so he drew off the shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders, and to all the people, Ye are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimech's, and all that was Chilon's, and, and Mahalon's, and the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabite, the, the Moabite, the wife of Mahalon, I have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the, the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witness this day. All right, so here we have kind of um, the, the major example of the kinsman redeemer being played out in, in um, the physical world here. That, that we know. So basically, what's going on with with Ruth? <clears throat> Naomi has uh, an Elimelech. They had two kids, um, uh, Chir uh, Chilion and Malon. And there's a famine in the land, so they 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 take off from Moab. Well, when they get to Moab, um, Elimelech dies, Chilion dies, Malon dies. But before those two boys died, they married two young ladies. And one of those young ladies was named Ruth. And Naomi, she's going to go back. She's like, I've lost everything. I'm going back to Israel. And Ruth says, I'm going with you. Naomi has already told the two daughter-in-laws, go back to your families. I have nobody for you. I, I'm not going to marry again. I have no more sons. I have nobody to give to you. And this was a custom that was throughout the whole region. Okay, This wasn't just an Israel. Israeli or Jewish custom, this is something that was part of um, the law of that of that Eastern world. That if 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 uh, a man died and his wife had and he had no children to receive the inheritance of his property, that the next the next in kin would would marry that person, and so that the first child born to them. Would receive the inheritance of the of the deceased person. Everybody tracking with me right now? That's the way. That's kind of the way it it was. It worked in those days that they needed somebody that was near kinsman to do that, so that the so that that name would continue on. The name was very important in those days. It would keep the name alive. Um, you know, kind of like. 
you know, we even, we, I mean, we kind of have that even in our own culture a little bit, that if you have all girls, you know, that, that last name just kind of goes away, right? There, there's no one to carry on that last, that last name. In this culture, it was more than just a name. It, it was a property. There was property associated with that. So if you were, so here in Boaz's case, there was property, but Ruth was actually a part of that property. So if he's going to get, if he's going to purchase that property, and he has to have Ruth, and he has to raise up, it was it was part of the duty. It it was looked negatively on uh, on a family if the person would not fulfill their role in making sure that the name of their close kin did not have somebody to inherit the, the property. Um, you know that's just how that's how they looked at, um, at their at their world that they they cared about they cared about their family so much that they would be willing to mar their own inheritance to sustain their other family's inheritance. If, if is that is it is it making sense a little bit? I know it's it's a cultural difference, so it's it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. But that's kind of the law that's that's there to promote to promote the lineage even on after the death of the person. So really what we have here is when Boaz and Ruth have a child, that that child is taking on the, the birthright. And that's really what it is. It's the birthright. You know, when you go back all the way to Jacob and Esau, we understand the birthright a little bit better, right? Um, the birthright receives the promises. And here we have the promises being passed on to the next generation. Who's going to get that? We need somebody to be able to take on the birthright, to take on the promises, to take on the inheritance, to be to be the leader in the family. That's what this is. That's kind of what we're seeing here. So Adam has lost dominion. Okay. So we have this law that's kind of come into the Eastern culture here, this kinsman redeemer to promote that name. Well, Adam has lost it. He's, he's lost the dominion. So all those things to really control this world, they're gone. They're not available to Adam anymore. So now we need somebody to come in who's like Adam, who's not going to die, who can, take, who can take over these things. We need a kinsman redeemer. We need somebody to, to be able to... Uh, to do like Boaz and and promote the family and bring the family's name um, back to life. That was going to be Boaz's job. That's also the job of somebody that we see in the book of Revelation. So turn to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Five nine. Five nine. You want to take that, Josh? Sure. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. All right, so here we have Boaz <laughs> and Ruth. He, re he redeems Ruth. He redeems the land. Here in Revelation, we have, um, we, we have these people, they sing, they, they sing this song about Jesus. And he has... He has been able to fill the role just like Boaz has done. He's able to redeem us. He's Now, there was another guy, right? There was another kinsman in Boaz's day. Could he have done it? And he's like, I can't do it. I'll mess up my own inheritance if I do it. I can't do it. He turns it over to Boaz. Boaz, it, I give it to you. And Boaz is able to. He's willing to. He does. He does everything that's needed to be able to do that. That's what Jesus does. Not just anybody can do it. it there has to be spe there's specific requirements required. So here, they sing that song, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and hast made unto us our God, kings, and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So that's, so can you see how the, the link is, is forming here? If you wonder why the book of Ruth is even in there, it's to tell us, it's to try to help give us a, a picture of what the Redeemer looks like. What that picture painted is a, how it's supposed to function in, 
in the life of a, of a believer. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, there were different requirements. And there being, were different requirements. Yeah, being kin was one of them. Um, being willing to do it. <clears throat> right. What else? Um, being able to. Being willing, being able, mm -hmm. and then actually fulfilling. Right. Yeah, there, there's several. We're actually going to look at some of those, so good on you that, that you, you knew those. Um, it must be worthy. You know, you've got to be able to meet all the requirements. That's, that's what you see in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 4. John, he sees this, and he says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look upon. Now, if you're wondering what's going on here, we're, we're talking about the seven-sealed document in heaven. This is a title deed. Is um, you know just to kind of give you an illustration of these things, they have found two uh, scrolls just like this in 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 the Middle East area, with uh, written on the front, written on the back, just like this scroll is, and it's sealed with seven seals. And uh, those each of those seven seals is done by an individual witness, and they have found two of those in archaeology. Both of those, when they pulled the seals off, you know what they discovered? their title deeds to property. So what we're seeing here in chapter 5 is a title deed probably to planet Earth. What was given in it to Adam as dominion, those de that dominion lasted while Adam did with those things that were right in God's eyes. But whenever, he, but whenever he, the fall happened, a lot of that dominion was, was hijacked by Satan. That's why Satan wanted Adam to fail. That's why he wanted him to fall. He wanted to have that control. If Adam was in charge of, uh, of these things, that meant Adam, he would have never died. He would still be present. He would be the one who would be the ultimate ruler of this planet. He would be the guy in charge. But he's not here. And there's never been another guy created like Adam who hasn't died. Is that making sense? Except for Jesus. And in the book of Revelation, we see that this, this is what is happening. That Jesus has fulfilled the promise of the kinsman redeemer. And there are certain requirements to be, to be the, the, that Adam, to be that second Adam. When you sing the song, Hark the Herod Angels Sing, you sing a verse that talks about Jesus being the second Adam. Good song, lots of theology in that song, but it's about, but it's really about the kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, being able to meet all the requirements. He had to be able to meet all the requirements. Not just anybody's able, only Jesus was able. That's why John is upset here. He's like, there's no man. There is no man who was able to do that. So he had to be human. Okay? The person had to be human. He had, to make, he had to be made in like form as Adam. So how was Adam made? Think about this just for a second. Y'all think deep with me. How was Adam made? By dust of the earth. Yeah, God created him with his own, basically with his own hands. He formed him. Interesting enough, when Mary conceives, who's the father? Who's the father of what is in, in Mary's womb? Is God. it Joseph? God is. It's God. God formed that body in the womb. Interesting enough, the scripture talks about the dust being like the, the heart of the earth. And whenever and it uses the same kind of theo, the, the same kind of thinking when he refers to the womb of a woman, that that's the heart of the earth. And I don't know. I'm not sure why it does that. I guess maybe because it ties it in. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't come up with that. But the scriptures do. And it says the, the second Adam had to have God as the father, just like Adam was. Adam had no physical father. He had God the father. Jesus had God the father. And, he, and was, what was conceived was placed, conceived by the, the Holy Spirit, just basically... Basically, like Adam was. God breathed into Adam, right? The breath of God, the spirit of life. The spirit of God gave him that life. Same thing happened with Jesus. So he had to be made like, like Adam. And able to, commit, to keep the commandments 
and not sin and overcome death. He had to be he had to be able to do all those things. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. That he was able to keep the commandments. He did not sin. And when he did come to the grave, what happened when he went to the grave? How did that how did that you ultimately play out? When Jesus went to the grave, what happened? He rose again. He rose again. Yeah, death could not keep him. But where's Adam? Adam's still dead. His body never, never came out of it. But Jesus, because he did not have sin, you see, death is passed on from the physical father to each generation. Jesus didn't have that. Adam passed that death on when he failed in the garden, when he partook of the, what God said, don't do. He broke the commandment. Jesus didn't break the commandment. That even in his body, the life was able to come back to the body because he didn't break the commandments. Isn't that interesting? So here we have what Adam could not do, we, can, we have being accomplished in Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, is so important. Because I know there's a lot of theology here, but that's why he had to do these things. So that he could reclaim what was lost in the garden. Everybody still with me? I know I'm, I know I'm getting, I'm all, know I'm in the weeds. Y'all got any questions? Anything, anything. Y'all got to have complete, full understanding of what, everything that I just said. If you do, you need to explain it to me because I'm not even sure if I do. All right. Well, I guess we're pressing on. Now, another thing, he's able to pay the price. To redeem somebody, you got to pay the price. Boaz had to pay the price. Well, what was the wages of sin? Death. Death. Right? That without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Jesus had to redeem that. That's what we see in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. Somebody read that verse for me. No, one, you want to take that verse? 5, 6. 5, 6. <coughs> and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits All right, so the lamb as it had been slain, the price was death. He had to be able to pay that price to shed that blood during for Adam's, you know, of, of Adam's race. And he had to be willing to pay that price. Again, here in five in five six, he was willing to pay the price. You remember back in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He was willing to pay the price. The price was <coughs> death. That was the price. To go through that whole, that whole process. Okay? To, to, be, to be that lamb that shed its coat... For Adam and Eve's sin, now we have the Messiah. We have God in the flesh dying for sin. That, that to pay that price. And that's and, and that's an under, a thing that we need to understand. When, whenever you see the um the the, the um that he you know the prop the, the I'm trying to think of where that verse is, but it talks about the sin there, and if you look up what that sin actually is, it's the penalty of sin, the payment for sin, the fine of sin. So it's not just when it says, it, you know, in Jesus there was no sin, but he was willing to pay that all the sin of the world was put on him. What was actually happening is the payment for sin was put on him. Not, all, not literally all the sins that we have all committed, but the penalty of those sins, that's the problem. The sin is your problem. The payment of the sin is what God has taken care of. He has taken care of the payment of sin. 
And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, I can do a lesson that just talks about that one day. I don't have all those verses with me. But that's what's really going on. It's not that all the sins of the world are put on, on Jesus. It's the payment for sin. That he took on that role for himself to pay for everyone's sin. That's why if you're going to be saved, you have to fully trust in Jesus. You have to fully be confident that he, is, that he has paid the price for your sin. That's exactly what we see in the, in the law of the Kismet and Redeemer. Willing to pay the price and to neglect one's own inheritance. Now this, now you think about what this is going on, what's going on here. We have Jesus who is, he, we, we already read that part where he's in the throne of heaven, right? In Ezekiel, he's sitting on the throne. He, that's his inheritance. Yet he is willing to neglect his inheritance, right? To become the second Adam. So whenever he neglects his own inheritance, he comes down, he redeems you, and he passes that inheritance to you. Look what the scripture, do y'all remember the scripture that we just read? What did that scripture say in verse 10? Joy, read that, read that verse. Uh, Revelation 5 and 10. So here we have Jesus has neglected his own inheritance, redeemed us, and now we are kings and priests in this world. That's what Adam was. And now because what Jesus has done as the kinsman redeemer, he has, he has restored us to that position. And he has shared it with us, just like Boaz does with the, with the seed that's going to come. From, uh, from his and Ruth's redemption process of him fulfilling the law of the kinsman redeemer. D is that making sense? Yeah, that's the uh, royal priesthood, like the order of Melchizedek. A absolutely, absolutely. Which was part of the plan before the Levitical priesthood. It, it was. Yeah, Adam was, I, Adam was that guy mm -hmm. until, until he failed in, in the garden. And then here we have Jesus comes back on the scene in the book of Revelation. So really what we're having is we're having what started in the garden end in Revelation. The, what, where Adam fell, the second Adam prevails. Are, are, is everybody kind of still tracking with me? I know it's a big concept. It's important to understand this because, you know, at, at least the concept anyway. Because you got to know, well, why is it important that Jesus die on the cross? Why was it important that God become flesh? Why was it important for him to experience all those things? And then we see it all start to come together here in Revelation chapter 5. This is the beginning of the redemption of what it took to redeem us as, in, um, as the kinsman redeemer. And then you have to accept the one to be redeemed and its baggage. Just like Boaz. He had, the property came with Ruth. He had to accept Ruth. He had to accept that she was not a Jew. He had to accept that she was from a pagan world. He, he had to accept that she had had another husband. He had to accept all those things and all the things that he went through. Well, that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. He's accepted us and all of our baggage, it, even our failures. He has done that. He's accepted you despite yourself. Does that make, does that make sense to you? That that's what, that's what the kinsman redeemer had to do. I mean, if the picture's painted in the book of Ruth, it's fulfilled in, finally in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 5. And actually, you know, we see it start to play out throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. So, um, any questions so far? Even before Ruth, um, now it's just because we were reading about the lamb in Revelation 5, yeah. it's like when mm -hmm. Abraham is getting ready to sacrifice Isaac, God says he's going to provide himself a lamb, himself yeah. a lamb. Mm -hmm. And the first, that first prophecy coming true, that was a ram the first time, it wasn't right. a lamb. Right. So we were talking about dual prophecies, and the second one's even better. Right. That's a big one. It is a big one.
Yeah, the picture is all through. It's, it, I'm telling you, if if you uh, th this is the reason why I'm, I'm trying to explain this to you is that when you go back, and if you've got this kind of on the back burner of of your of your mind as you read through the scripture, as you when you start reading again in the book of Genesis and you start you start making your way through the scriptures, all of a sudden you see this storyline playing out right in front of your eyes. And you would have missed it had you not known to look for the evidence of the kinsman redeemer playing out. You would miss it. It's kind of like um, the image of God. I think all of you were here for that. If you start wrecking, if you understand that concept, as you read the scripture, you begin to see the image of God being fulfilled throughout the scripture. And not just that, but also in your own life. And that's the, that's the way that the law of the kinsman redeemer works out too. It's, you don't have to fully have, have complete understanding of it, but to, un, but to know that the concept is there and how it kind of works, because I have not, I, I doubt that I have really hit even the tip of the iceberg on it, because I just know a little bit. And what, I'm, what I know, I'm sharing with you, so that you can begin to look for these pieces. And you guys are young enough. Nobody told me these things when I was your age, okay? But as you read the scriptures, you'll start being able to put more and more of, these, of the puzzle together. So by the time that you're, uh, you're, you're my age, maybe you'll have complete, complete, uh, um, and utter understanding of these things. And hopefully you can teach it better than me to guys that are now your age. That's, that's really what, you know, why I teach you things like this. So that as you read the scripture for yourself, God will show you and reveal things to you that everybody else is missing just because they don't know some fundamental things to look for. That's why the, kind of this is talking about, you know, the, 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 the faith fundamentals. Because if you know to look for this stuff, it's all over the place. Literally, all over the place. You see it in all over Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. You see it all over the place. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So, any questions so far? Um, the re repercussions of the fall. Let me see. What's my what's my time? Okay. Um, there's a continual fight. Uh, that that puts us back in Genesis chapter three. I'm going to kind of go through these. This, this is not near as um, as important as as the kinsman redeemer. I feel like that that's a very important concept that maybe you don't understand it. You need to know about it. You need you need a you don't need to be that person that ne that's like well I, I have no idea what you're talking about the kinsman redeemer. You do not need to be that person. You need to be the person. Oh, I know about the kinsman redeemer, and every time I open up my Bible, I'm looking for that to play out in that passage. So, uh, some of the repercussions of the fall is uh, look in verse 15 there of uh, chapter three. Josh, will you read that read that passage? Sure. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. All right. So there is a continual fight with Satan. Okay. Um, when he, when God, you know, when God is talking to Adam, Eve, and the serpent here, and Satan, there's actually four different characters here. Um, that God tells Eve that. And, Ad, and, and Adam's there listening to. He's like, all the children that you're going to have born to you, they're going to have a fight with Satan. This, this conflict that started at the tree will not end, ever. All your life, you're going to have to deal with this joker. It, it's, he's not just an enemy. He, it's an enmity. It's like all the time enemy. Okay, that, that's kind of what the expression that that word is. It's like he's an enemy all the time. He's always looking for a way into your life. He's always looking for a way to bring you down and to destroy you. He's not just an enemy. He is at enmity with you. He hates your guts. He wants to see you destroyed. And he's looking for every avenue and path to wreck your life. That's what he tells Eve. All, and it's not just ending with you guys. Because of what happened, every single person that's going to come from you guys are going to experience 
the same thing and have to deal with this joker. That's basically what that means. Continue flight with Satan. Anybody got anything? Press it on. Um, there's conception issues and child rearing sorrows. Look in verse 16 there. Anybody want to take verse 16? Eli, have you read one yet? Take verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain he shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. All right, so here we have the introduction of there's going to be conception issues and child rearing sorrows. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I used to think that, you know, just uh, going through the birthing process was, was hard until, uh, until, I ex until I experienced a growing kid. And, uh, you know, go back and put them in the, in the womb and experience that again to get over the other stuff. At least that ends. You know, growing kids with problems are are tough, and some people have a lot of problems. So here we have, you know, the conception. Uh, I do think it's interesting that that humans are a little bit different in their conception. That they can do that every month, um, whereas most most biological creatures they have a season in which they are that they conceive. So. Um, I think God is God is just kind of telling like some things are changing now and that's that's one of those again I'm not saying I completely understand all that it's like God's just telling us you're gonna have you're gonna have problems can with the you know in the conceiving area you're also gonna have problems with child rearing that your kids are gonna be problems to you uh, I think this is really what God is telling them. and uh, are you guys problems to your to your parents? Not at mm. yeah. all. Yeah. Mm. Yep. See, you're liars. <laughs> Tough crowd for this one. <laughs> uh, also, in verse in verse sixteen, um, you you see some marriage issues comes on, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Basic in a summary of what that means is, um, there's problems in marriage. Marriages are not perfect. They have to be worked at. Um, you got two sinners married to each other. They sin against each other, and they have to deal with that. And that's really what that verse is, is really drawing to attention, that uh, you think whenever you marry somebody, oh, this is the most perfect person in the entire world. That perfect person is going to cause you a lot of problems. It, it's not going to – if you're going to have a good marriage, it's because you work – in the redemption area of life and the area of forgiveness, um, the area of agape love, that's what you have to do. You know, because here it is. God tells them you're going to have marriage issues. You know, and it didn't take long for it to start, right? What did they do? When the first sin that comes along, what did they do? His fault, her fault. It's fault, right? They they start pointing blame. They don't take they don't take ownership. All right, and then we talked about dominion lost. Those are those are some of the things in seventeen through nineteen. Um, who wants to take who wants to take that? Michael, I think it's your turn. Go ahead and read those those few verses right there. Seventeen nineteen. Seventeen through nineteen. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of waste thou hast taken, and thus... For dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. All right, so does that sound like a guy who's got control over his surroundings? No, everything's out of control now. Thorns, thistles, sweat. He's going to have to work hard. It's not just going to, he can't just speak to the weed like, you don't belong here, you need to be feet. You know, it's not going to work like that anymore. He's going to have to reach down. He's going to have to pull that thistle up. It's going to prick him. It's going to poke him. 
He's gonna have to. He's gonna have to deal with those type of obstacles in every single aspect of life. Nothing is going to be easy for you, Al. Have y'all experienced that yet? I think Eric? the one who really start to understand it is in uh, Ecclesiastes. Oh yeah. All he's talking about is all the days of your vanity. Right. This is your lot in life. Right. This is all your lot. All these things in life. right here. Yeah. Have, have y'all noticed that in your life so far? Does everything come easy to you, or do you have to work hard? Eli's like, man, I, every day's easy for me. I'm, uh, perfect. I'm gonna belly you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it starts. It starts early on, right? Um, things are tough. You know, kids do. Kids when they start walking, right? They 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 get a lot of scratches, a lot of bruises, a lot of bumps. Everything's hard, and it never changes throughout the rest of your life. There's always bumps, bruises, scratches, nicks, cuts. Uh, sometimes you even get maimed a little bit. Um, oh, the TV turned off? Yep. Well, that's weird. wonder why I did that. I got some new purple pet. Um, do you think ten tenic technological issues was also part of that curse? Well, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So, um, and then the ground is cursed. Uh, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, what comes from you know what that really boils down to and I just kind of put my idea up there that I, I think it has to, I think taxes is a curse wars are a curse corruption pain worry illness death pain all those things are you, you know what one of the things that atheists will, will will bring to the table is like well why would a good God create so much pain and suffering in this world he didn't he didn't. The pain and the suffering, those things that we experience, the things that are so hard, those are repercussions of the fall. Those are the things we, we created those, not God. Okay? All those things are our fault, not God's fault. He made it perfect. Everything he made was very good. And we took the very good things and we said, eh, we like the fruit better. Yeah, this verse 15 is just, it's like the birth of warfare. It's kind of a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And this is just them reaping what they sow. Right. It, that, that is, you know, uh, and that's how I read this passage right here. It, it really is, it's, these are just symptoms of the, of, of the sin nature that is now in the world. All, that, that's really what's going on. And God just tells them, he just kind of gives them a summary of, this is what you're going to have to experience. Don't be surprised when these things come your way. Your life is totally changed now. So, and that really is what sin does. All these things, repercussions of those things. And uh, that is it. Um, hopefully y'all got something out of that, or at least a, a perspective. You know, that's really what I was going for, is to give you a perspective of when you read the scriptures that you... Uh, that you have some things on the back burner that's always cooking, right? Always simmering a little bit. And as you read the scriptures and you study for yourself, that all of a sudden you're going to read it, you're going to read something, and all of a sudden, wow, there's there's what's been cooking for a while. And it'll give you, it'll give you something more to throw in that pot, right? Because that's really what, what's going on. You know, some of these things, is, it's like a stew. And... When you get, as you gain more information, you know, that's just something to add to the stew mix to make it a little bit more, more to add to the thickness of it. So, with that, um, any questions before we, uh, we close in prayer? I know that I were, there was a lot there. That's not even the whole Kinsman Redeemer story, Dark. Oh, no. I gave you a very summarized view, uh, view of it. I've, I've got a message that I could, I could go for probably two hours on. Um, so I gave you the dumbed down version just because I, I just want you to consider it for yourself you will get the whole thing if you stick around here you'll get the whole thing one day because it, it's it's worth talking about over and over again anybody got anything no man you guys are so full of questions let me pray for you dear Lord that you would be with the, this group of young folks who are here tonight that you would just bless their lives Lord Guide them in your ways, help them to know your truths, and just 
lead them in the, in the study of your word, Lord, that you'll just uh, fill them with your spirit and knowledge and wisdom and understanding, that they can know your truths and allow those truths to mold themselves and to develop them into the people that you want them to be. Guide us in all these things in Jesus' name.